Good. It's your fault. It's all yours all right. now. Good evening. Welcome to the meeting of Tuesday, September 12th. This meeting is being held in accordance with public laws of 1975, Chapter 231, An adequate notice of this meeting has been provided by a notice sent to the Star Ledger, the local source, and posted in the main lobby of the municipal building and the town website. Please stand, Pledge Allegiance. I, like the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One, one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice for all. We could stand for a moment of silence for our troops, both here and abroad. Thank you. I'd also like the, a moment of silence for victims from last. Oh, very good. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Thanks for the up. Madam Clerk, roll call, please. Mayor Stampoulis. I'm here. Deputy <coughs> Mayor Vassallo. Here. Committee Woman Budjanowski. Here. Committee Woman Dubois. Here. Committee Min Huber. Here. Okay. Welcome, everybody. We're going to start with um, proclamations and announcements. Um, first, I'd like to introduce um, from the Union County Community Law Enforcement um, Division, Officer Victoria Smith, and from Prevention Links, Ms. Morgan Thompson. They're going to speak to us regarding their uh, CLEAR program. Welcome. Thank you so much for having us tonight. My name is Morgan Thompson. I'm the Director of Recovery Support Services for Prevention Links. You've got to speak in the microphone. You, gotta, you can't hear your finger back. No, no, maybe you can you take can it off if you'd like. You can take it off if you'd like. Absolutely. It's like karaoke. <laughs> <laughs> Better? Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Don't have a lot of. <laughs> now we pick a song and you say. Okay, ready? La la la. <laughs> so, um, my name is Morgan Thompson. I'm the director of recovery support services for Prevention Links. We're a substance abuse prevention and recovery support nonprofit serving all of Union County. And this is. I'm Officer Victoria Smith. I'm with the Union County Sheriff's Office. Um, I am part of the community outreach uh, section of our office, and I also assist with Clear and helping individuals seek <coughs> recovery. And so we thank you so much for having us here tonight to talk about a very important issue that's going on both locally around the county, state, and country, um, and that is the opioid epidemic that is just ravaging our communities. Um, so really we're here to talk more so though about an initiative, the Union County Clear program that um, is really designed to, to face the opioid epidemic head on. It's one of an array of um, new initiatives that have come to Union County to really help folks find recovery from addiction um, instead of uh, overdose, incarceration, and all the different consequences that we know all too well. Um, just a little bit of background, um, CLEAR stands for Community Law Enforcement Addiction Recovery Program, and we're a partnership between Union County, um, the Union County Sheriff's Office, the Union County Prosecutor's Office, Union County Police, and Prevention Links. So um, a lot of different partners involved. We also have our treatment partners, primarily uh, New Hope Foundation and uh, Turning Point in Patterson, and those are the two county contracted treatment programs. And so I'll talk a little bit more about those programs and their work with us, but just a little bit of background in case you're not super familiar with why um, the opiate epidemic has become such a, a prevalent issue in recent years. Um, we've seen a lot of prescription drug abuse, a lot of diversion of um, drugs that are meant to be used to treat pain for very legitimate conditions, getting in the hands of the wrong people, or those who are taking them for legitimate health reasons, taking them for too long, maybe because of lack of education or for any number of reasons, and becoming physically dependent on them, developing a clinical substance use disorder. Um, many people um, have turned because of uh, you know, the cheapness and availability to street drugs like heroin, um, and now we're seeing a surge in overdose deaths with um, the introduction of fentanyl and now cart fentanyl, which are two very, very potent, um, much more so than heroin and the typical opiates we see. Um, and just a, a speck can, of the substance can kill. Um, so it's very dangerous. We're seeing it, you know, um, more and more prevalent in our community. Um, and so overdose deaths, sadly, continue to rise. Um, we're particularly vulnerable here in Union County because of our proximity to the ports, um, because of our proximity to New York City. 
Um, so there's, there's just a lot of drug activity, sadly, in this area. Um, 40 million Americans meet the criteria for a substance use disorder, but only 11% of those 40 million Americans get the treatment they need. Um, part of that is because of stigma, not knowing where or how to seek help, if it's okay to seek help. Um, and so programs like CLEAR are really designed to reduce some of those barriers. Um, in the past, law enforcement has taken a, a different approach to addiction, perhaps a criminal approach, but now we know that addiction is a, is a health condition, and so um, you know, the, the law enforcement that we work with, and Officer Smith is gonna speak more to that, has really embraced that public health approach to um, substance use disorders and ensuring that instead of sending people to jail, making sure that they get the treatment that they need to recover. Um, and so I'm gonna let Officer Smith talk a little bit about the program and what happens when somebody comes to participate in CLEAR. <coughs> Thank you, Morgan. So basically what happens when we have someone who comes into the sheriff's office is I meet them at the, at the, eight, um, the new annex building and I'll meet them at the door. Once they clear our security, I'll go ahead, if they, I'll ask them if they have anything on them, drugs, paraphernalia, anything like that, and I would take it from them. My, it's, all, it's me and another officer, um, either myself or someone else who's in plain clothes. But the reason why we do plain clothes is because we don't want to give them that fear of, I'm going to go speak to a police officer right now. Um, I'm dressed the way I am right in front of you. Um, you know, they can hardly tell that I'm ever even an officer. So once I meet with them, I go ahead and I bring them downstairs, um, and we put them in a secluded area, and I'll just ask them for um, very simple information, name, date of birth, social security number, um, and we'll ask if they have a driver's license, if they have a contact, emergency contact, anybody that they want to put down. Once we get that information, we do have officers run them, uh, run their backgrounds. And the reason why we do that is we want to make sure that, they, that they're eligible for the program. They're ineligible if they have an actionable warrant. If it's in the county, within Union County, we do make our best efforts to go ahead, especially because we work right there in the courthouse, we go ahead and we uh, see if we can get the warrant cleared. Um, and we've had very much success in doing that with people within the county who have had that issue and then getting them into the treatment. And the reason why we do that, like Morgan said, is because we're trying to get out of uh, the, the criminal aspect of it and really get them the help that they need. We do understand that you know, they may have a past or whatever the case may be, however we are there to help them. So once they are deemed eligible, we go ahead and we call a recovery coach. They have within 30 minutes to get down to our location or the Union County Police Department location so that they can go ahead and give you know, the treatment that these people need. Um, once they go ahead and they meet with them, an officer does stay outside of the secluded area just for security purposes, both for um, the participant and for the recovery coach, but we do not go inside and, and are there when they are asked the questions that they are asked, only so that it, they understand that it is private and that we are not there to um, have them incriminate themselves. Um, so once they go ahead and either Morgan or the other recovery coach goes ahead and speaks with them, they are you know, assigned to treatment. Uh, we go ahead and we thank them for coming in and then we go ahead and have them go, go on to whatever it is. Maybe it's that day of going into treatment or um, if it's a, let's say a Thursday or Friday and they can't get into a treatment center right away, they go in on Monday, we thank them for coming um, and we just let them know that, that we're here to help them instead of making them feel like they're bad people for, for, for suffering from this, this horrible addiction. So that's our end of it. Um, uh, my, my specific job of, in all this is I do go out and speak about CLEAR a lot to the community. Um, I do a lot of the advertising, so I may not be always on the front line meeting with the individuals who come in, but it is my responsibility to go out there into the community and let them know that this program is um, very much up and running. It's here, and we want to go ahead and tackle uh, this, this problem within our communities. And so just a little bit more information about the recovery coaching component. Um, a major issue that we find is that when folks go into treatment, it's, it's an acute episode of treatment, right? So I often like to use the example of if somebody is diabetic and they go into the hospital because they're having you know, a, a diabetic uh, you know, issue um, and, and they get treatment, they get stabilized, but then there's no follow-up care, there's no ongoing insulin or you know education change in diet exercise incorporation so it's very much the same with recovery that 
short period of time that the person is in treatment <coughs> is really just to stabilize them. Even if they come back to the community or are engaged in an outpatient program for a period of time, that's not forever. So there has to be this transition to having those ongoing community-based grassroots supports. And that's where a recovery coach can really play an instrumental role. So all of our coaches um, are in recovery themselves. They have that lived experience. They've been through it. And so that level of identification is very helpful um, for folks who are you know, not necessarily yet in recovery or may just be contemplating recovery as an option for them. So um, when our coaches arrive at the station, they're really just uh, there as not a professional, not, not, not a therapist, not a case manager, nothing like that, just somebody who can identify, who can be there to support. And so they um, just take about 15, 20 minutes to get to know the person, um, determine what the right level of care is for them, and then they make a referral to one of our programs that the Union County Freeholders have contracted with. Um, and, and I will say, one of the, the really neat things about the program here in Union County, there are many like it around the state and around the country, but our freeholders have committed an additional $150,000 to securing additional treatment beds in anticipation of this program. And so we're really able to meet the treatment need, um, whereas a lot of other programs cannot. We, they've created an, an opportunity like this for folks to come get help, and then there's no beds available, there's no funding available. So because of that, effort by our freeholders, um, we, we really have been able to meet the needs of everybody that's come through the program so far. Um, we did just launch in June. Um, we started off two days a week. We're now full-time, five days a week, Monday through Friday, nine to five. Um, and as Officer Smith said, um, we have two locations. One is at the, um, the new courthouse annex in the basement, um, and the other is at the Union County Police Department in Westfield. Um, so basically, uh, you know, the one thing I'll add is that in addition to getting them into treatment, we do follow up with them first on a weekly basis. Once they leave treatment, the recovery coaches will touch base with the person, um, help ensure that they're getting to maybe 12-step meetings, AA or NA, smart recovery or another form of self-help, make sure that the, if there's a treatment need that they're ha you know, having that treatment need met, and also in the event that there is a relapse, getting you know, the individual back into treatment quickly so as to minimize any you know, damage or uh, you know, to, to increase the likelihood that they'll sustain recovery. So um, you know, it's, it's really innovative, phenomenal work. We're seeing a lot of success already, and I just want to make sure that every resident of Union County knows this is available. Yeah, we'll, start, we'll start with questions. Okay. Yes. Go ahead. All right. Um, you said if someone comes in Thursday or Friday, you send them home. How many don't come back? We typically haven't had that issue. Um, most days we can get them in within 24 hours, and if they're not going directly from the police station to the treatment center, our coaches are staying connected with them through the night. Sometimes we can meet with them at a community-based 12-step meeting or other support group. Um, it really depends, but we haven't had an issue where somebody was scheduled and they didn't go. It just hasn't happened yet, and I think it's because we have that continuity. We have the clear phone. They're able to call in, so they stay in touch with us during any wait time. Yes, the only thing I'm worried about is the weekend because the temptation's out there. Yeah, I mean, they can of go wherever they get it from. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a great program. <clears throat> I support it 100%, but it's the only thing, you know, I mean, like we have, hope here when people's fire captains and all that. We have arrangements from some hotels, you know, in the area. I mean, maybe something like that would help your program, you know, if, if you could get hotels, Elizabeth or Kenilworth or, and that. It's an excellent point. And we, we are, you know, pursuing some different avenues yeah. like that. We would ideally like to see, you know, and, and if there's a, an immediate medical issue, they're definitely going into the hospital yeah. if there's not, you know. And, and, and regardless, sometimes there's a medical issue that prevents them from being able to go directly to treatment. So, okay. yeah. Keep it up. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I just wanted to say, Eric, could you voice? Uh, I just wanted to say that I'm really grateful for the program being here, and I think it's fantastic. And you mentioned the stigma surrounding this particular addiction, and we recently adopted a resolution to become a stigma-free community in regards to mental health. And it's a passion of mine and this falls under that umbrella of course even though this stems from a little bit different than other drug addictions i feel i think not being an expert in the field and i wanted to do i wanted to keep in contact with you ladies because 
I wanted to do some sort of maybe mental health fair with for resources and addiction sometime in the near future in the next few months and I'd love to connect with you to work on that together and I think bring what you're talking about to the table to the community because I think it's fantastic so if we can connect I think that would be Absolutely. awesome yes thank, thank you thank you so one of the questions I have is um, do they people just walk in or or you see you know how, how does that work again they absolutely just walk in. Walk we actually had um, one of our first participants, um, her sister, I think it was, found out about the program online mm -hmm. and just walked right in on a Tuesday morning and there you have it. So it, is, it has a lot to do on our Sheriff's Facebook page. We do go ahead and announce every Tuesday and Thursday there is a special bulletin up there reminding people. So it's a constant um, reminder. It's a constant advertisement. It's a constant conversation about we're here. We're here to help you. Um, if you don't want to walk in because you're too afraid, here's a number you can call. You can call anonymously or you can, you can speak to a recovery coach right away. So there are different avenues, but yes, they do just walk in and, and it's, it's all by word of mouth, which is one of the reasons why this meeting was very important because um, we are trying to get the, the word out there. Great. All right. Thank you. Did you ever stage any interventions? Does anybody ever go out specifically to an individual if somebody else calls a member of the family and say, you know, this individual really needs help? Do you ever do anything like that? Or is it just specifically a walk-in? Yeah. It is. Walk-in or, like I said, they will call the clear hotline that we have and speak to a recovery coach. And they can either provide their name or, or not to that. Okay. And do you ever follow up with these individuals after they've gone through the program? Do you have any follow-up with them to find out if they have a better quality of life? or? Yeah, or, their so, fam or, or reach out to their family members. I don't know how that works. If we do both. Confidentiality clause. Or yeah, we do. We, we also, um, every participant has to have an emergency contact, and we ask that they give us permission to speak with that person also That's about good. their ongoing progress, particularly, right. you know, in some cases, they'll leave treatment early or something like that. Right. And, then, and you wonder why. Right. But, you know, right. honestly, <laughs> when we've had that happen, we've been able to get them back into That's treatment great. after that. So, you know, the numbers are low so far, but what we're seeing is really great success. That was my next um, question. Yeah. Yeah. That was so, my next question, but I know it takes time. We should have um, a report with some preliminary outcomes around December. So that'll be six months into the program. Yeah. And so then we can track folks. Um, the plan is to really just stay in touch with them until they're in stable recovery. Great. Um, but you know, as long as they'll respond to, right, of course. Of course so, right. and well, thank you. Yeah, thank absolutely. you for all you do. My question is for the residents that are watching that say can't get to Elizabeth, what would they do locally? Like, would they contact or come in downstairs to our police department or see our officers? How would they go about coming to you from here? They could definitely do that. So anyone who is watching who knows of someone who maybe would like some type of um, recovery treatment could actually go down to their police department and just say to them, listen, I have this, this issue, I, I would like some help. Um, the good thing about it is that although the sheriff's office, like I said, we do follow court hours, um, there's also the Union County PD building, which is in Westfield, mm -hmm. um, which is a little out of the way, but it still is a lot closer. And as you know, they're full 24-hour running department. So they can definitely um, reach out to their local department and then have someone either guide them in the right direction to go to either one of the locations okay. that can and help them. All the police departments in Union County are aware of this program? I personally <laughs> went to each <laughs> police department in Union County and gave them our clear That's pamphlets. Nice. Um, I did make it my personal business to stop at everyone. Anyone who would listen, I, I spoke with them. Um, a lot of people didn't have time, which is absolutely okay, but I did let them know, listen, here's my card. If you have any questions, please give me a call. So it did go out to every um, municipality and, and an office and every police department in Union County. Are you, are you going the one other thing? Are you going to high schools? I think it'd be a great program just to stop at the high schools. I know, Chief, you've done things in high school with like that. But I mean to for you to go and you know, say something I know in Dayton I like it done in Dayton. I think this is age restricted, right? If I'm correct, Officer Smith? The clear program, yes. yes. Yeah. Um however we are yes, yeah, she's gonna speak okay. on that. Real quick. Um, Prevention Links actually works closely with the adolescent population as well. So while they wouldn't be eligible for the CLEAR program, we could assist them. We actually have a, a recovery mentorship program for youth, and Prevention Links opened New Jersey's first recovery high school, which is right in Roselle. We take students from all over Union County, all over the state, really, anywhere How that they come that to us. Since 2014. Wow, that's fantastic. So please spread the word about that, too. Oh, okay. <laughs> Did yeah. know about that. I'd like to know more about that. I'll, I have your contact info, so I'll, I'll be reaching out. I can come back, no problem. <laughs> Any I'll questions? I'll hold you to it. Any questions on this end? <clears throat> no. no. 
Thank you. Well, I want to thank you both very much. I think yeah. what we should do is set up something um, on a separate day that we can, I believe last year or the year before we did something with narcotics in that whole division. Maybe we can combine everything together and send it out to the community and get a nice outcome. So I want to thank you, Officer Smith and Ms. Thompson for coming. Thank you so thank much. You for appreciate having us. I really appreciate thank your you effort. So yeah. Thank you. Well done. Moving on to proclamations. I have a proclamation for Ovarian Awareness uh, Month. Um, before I read this, I just wanted to preface that I've lost my mother in 1997 to um, a gynecologically related cancer, more specifically endometrial cancer, although it's not ovarian cancer. And I have to admit, at that time when there was a lot of cancer research, um, in these specific gynecological cancers, sometimes I didn't know exactly what the individual died from or where that particular cancer emanated from. Uh, for my mother, it was very far gone. It was stage three, and unfortunately, she was very ill, and they gave her about oh, six months to live, and she lived approximately two years, which was unheard of in 1997. I guess she was a fighter and didn't want to give up. So um, with that, I'd like to read this proclamation. Um, it's a proclamation for Ovarian Cancer Awareness Month. Whereas each September, America calls attention to a deadly disease that affects thousands of women across our country. This year, over 22,000 women will develop ovarian cancer, or more than half will die of this disease. They are mothers and daughters, sisters and grandmothers, community members and cherished friends, and the absence they leave in our hearts will be deeply felt forever. And whereas women are all too often diagnosed with this disease when it has already reached an advanced stage. Because early detection is the best defense against ovarian cancer, it is essential that women know the risk factors associated with the disease. Any woman who thinks she is at risk of ovarian cancer or experiences symptoms including abdominal pain, pressure or swelling should talk with their health care provider and whereas during National Ovarian Cancer Awareness Month, we honor those we have lost, show our support for women who bravely carry on the fight, and take action to lessen the tragic toll ovarian cancer takes on families. We stand with all those that have known the pain of ovarian cancer, and we rededicate ourselves to the pursuit of new and better ways to prevent, detect, and treat this devastating disease. I, Maria Vassallo, Deputy Mayor of the Township of Springfield, on behalf of the Township Committee, do hereby proclaim September 2017 as Ovarian Cancer Awareness Month in the Township of Springfield, and by this action, let it be known that we extend a hand to all women battling ovarian cancer and pledge our support to them, their families, and the goal of defeating this disease. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Uh, I'd like to make the announcement of our appointments to the planning board. Uh, we appointed Ms. Sylvia Grzbowski, class four member, to fill term expiring December 31st, 2020, and Ms. Tara Benigno, alternate member, to fill term expiring on December 31st, 2017. Also, uh, bulk pickup will be Wednesday, September 13th, and Tuesday, September 14th. We will continue with our fall festival and salute to the Veterans 5K run on Sunday, October 1st. To register for the race, please go on to their website at salute to veterans 5 kcom We're expanding recycling drop-off 7 a.m. to 11 a.m. and paper shredding from 9 till 1 at, on Saturday, October 7th at the pool. We are continuing with our farmer's market, which is Mondays through October 30th at our Springfield Public Library. And we have one more proclamation. Committee Room Rijanowski. This is the proclamation for the POW MIA Remembrance Day, which is September 15th, 2017. Whereas the Board of Chosen Freeholders of the County of Union has declared September 15th, 2017 as POW MIA Remembrance Day in the County of Union and Whereas all Americans everywhere owe a special debt of gratitude and a responsibility for remembering and honoring those who have given so much to make all of us free and secure mm -hmm. in this, our national homeland. 
and a recognition day is a fitting testament and remembrance for all of us for the sacrifices of our POW MIA veterans and whereas in honor of this special day, a ceremony will be held in front of the Union County Courthouse, Broad Street, Elizabeth, New Jersey, on Friday, September 15, 2017, at 1115 AM. Now, therefore, I, Jerry Ann Bujanowski, Committee Woman of the Township of Springfield, and on behalf of our Mayor, Diane Stampoulos, and the rest of the Township Committee, do hereby proclaim Friday, September 15, 2017, as POW MIA Remembrance Day in the Township of Springfield and encourage the residents to join me in making a special effort to give thanks and to remember the sacrifices rendered to us by all these noble sons and daughters of America. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, at this time we're going to have public comment on agenda items mm -hmm. only. Um, you see there's many people here, so if we're going to have you come up at this time, I want you to state your name and address and be mindful of our three minute time limit. Anyone? Public? From the public? About agenda items only. Okay. Going once. Moving on. Okay. See, seeing none, we're going to move on to our reports. Okay, so I make a motion to approve the total amount of payroll and vouchers for the period from August 15, 2017 to September 12, 2017. In the amount of two million seven hundred and twenty nine thousand five hundred and thirty five dollars and fifty eight cents. A second. Man roll call. Yeah. Committee woman Bujnowski. Yes. Deputy Mayor Vasallo. Yes. Committee woman Dubois. Yes. Committee man Huber. Yes. Mayor Stampoulis. Yes. Good evening, Mr. Quick. Do you have a budget status report for us? I do. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, just two quick items. I, I, everybody saw the budget status report over the weekend. There's no major exceptions uh, you saw on page two at this point in time. I don't think we're going to have any abnormalities also between now and the year end. At least I hope not. So as long as Irma and the rest of the hurricanes stay away from us, I think we're going to be in good shape. Just one last item. As everybody saw in my later email, on September 20th, we are going to go for one more ban renewal for $7.3 million, okay? The interest rate, I hope, is going to be somewhere around maybe 1.5% interest rates are going up. Unfortunately, we're not going to enjoy the rates we had last year, but I hope everything is going to be okay. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Questions, anyone? No. no. Thank you, Mr. Cook. <laughs> Good evening, Chief Cook. you have a report for us? Yes. Um, I'd first like to start off by um, kind of the young lady segued for me talking about the CLEAR program. Um, it's, our officers have been aware, since its inception, our officers have been uh, aware of how to handle should someone come into our department. Um, so, so we're on track with assisting anyone who comes to us for help. Uh, and we're hoping to get that word out. Uh, it's, it's a great program. I'm very proud that Union County is, is stepping forward with doing this. And uh, I mean, we look to, to make a difference as best we can. Um, these are things that we've been involved with for several years. I, as Mr. Huber stated, I speak to the high school to the kids um, about you know not only alcohol but but drugs and you know driving under the influence and driving while texting and all that. So we're trying to reach out to our kids. We've also been a part of uh, one of the earlier departments in Union County to be a part of Project Medicine Drop, trying to get the prescription drugs. Um, out of the homes and we take care of them we incinerate them and destroy them instead of uh, getting in the hands of it's not only kids unfortunately this the epidemic with prescription drugs and heroin is knows no bounds um, doesn't discriminate in any way um, unfortunately over the past several weeks we've had um, several instances of overdoses um, recently we've lost uh, a few residents in town, but we've also had a lot of saves as well. So the Narcan has certainly um, uh, been effective. Uh, again, this has been a pro this has been a problem nationwide for for some time now, and Union County is is taking great steps towards uh, trying to do what we can. I mean, it's it's an uphill fight, but we're definitely definitely in there and um, doing what we can. Um, as far as the rest of my report, uh, I would like to say 
Um, Detective Lieutenant Levinson, he had held a, a very, uh, very successful informational talk for fraud and other various topics with the seniors at the Senior Center. Uh, that would have been in July, I believe he had done that. Um, he's, again, a plethora of information when it comes to fraud. And uh, I know Ms. Bendrowski could probably speak because she was present when he had given, given his seminar, but uh, always very successful and they always asking for him to come back. Um, and segueing on, speaking of Lieutenant Levinson, uh, I, again, we had spoken to previous meetings about his uh, upcoming retirement. Um, and with that in mind, I have announced a uh, uh, an upcoming lieutenant's test to, to fill the vacancy once he retires. So I've had, I've notified the, the officers that are eligible. Um, everyone's aware of the upcoming test. I'm just waiting to see uh, how many sergeants are going to be uh, interested in taking that. And I will be giving the written part of the test sometime in November. Um, and I would like to thank everyone who uh, residents, business owners, I know township employees who participated in the 9-11 event that we held uh, yesterday in front of town hall. Um, it, it's, always, it's always nice to see people there uh, coming out to support and um, to remember. And I mean, it's something that we never should forget. Um, but I, I was very happy to see the turnout that we had for that. Uh, and one other thing in my report that I'll hit on is uh, training. Training was very minimal. Um, in July and August months, which is typical, uh, it's due to vacations and trying to limit the amount of overtime. So any training that we did have was, was in-house training uh, that did not cost us uh, any manpower uh, overtime hours. Um, aside from that, I believe, if, unless you have any questions, um, that'll be my report. Okay, first, um, with the test, you don't give it, don't you? Have, don't we have an outside firm from outside no. people, right? No, we've we've always given the test. Oh yeah. Oh, yes. I thought, I thought we with your test. Don't you have an outside source come in? Yes. Oh, all right. Well, I, I'm just. I thought we did. And talking about the drugs and that, how are you doing with the drop off down here at the police department? Is it? Is it a piece yeah, of I mean or? we're very successful with that. We're we're emptying it, you know, at least twice a week. Um, I don't have a total weight. Uh, well, now, I know we're well over a thousand pounds okay. we've collected since we started. I just, I just wanted to make sure it was working out. And it's, it's, it. Yeah, it's a great program. Um, again, it's, uh, I haven't looked at the log recently, and I, I mean, I'll, I'll make sure I put that in September's report what, well, what our totals are. I'm sure but it's successful in that. Anyway. Yeah, well, again, well over a thousand pounds. And if you think what a bottle of pills w might weigh, I mean, that's yeah. really insignificant, but it's it, weight wise anyway. Okay. Um, and we got over a thousand pounds of stuff like that. So it's, it's quite a bit. Okay. And we take it, it does get incinerated again. I'll emphasize it again. You don't need to take labels off bottles. Just you, you bring it here, you drop it in our drop box. Um, it's, the access is limited to uh, two of my personnel. Um, we don't bother to look to see whose name or what they may have been taken. We <laughs> don't care. We just want to get it off the, off the uh, streets to use that term loosely. Um, and it's under our control at all times. We take it, we deliver it to the, the, uh, the firm that's uh, assisting us, and we watch it from the moment we get it to the moment it goes into the incinerator. Uh, no one else sees anything that's on anything. So it's very anonymous. Um, you don't need to worry about taking stuff off, but. Thank you. You're welcome. I had a quick question, not about the report, but something that, um, people in the community have asked me and I figured since we're here I might as well ask you a lot of people do transactions online you know they sell things mm -hmm. whatever and I've seen that some communities I don't know if anybody locally in Union County have designated meetup spots to do that where it's safe for people to do so right. I don't believe we have that would that be something we might do that, it is statute? something actually uh, Mr. Shahadi and I were speaking of that just uh, recently um, officer what well now Seriously? sergeant yeah, Sar Sergeant Westover, when he was an officer, um, several months back, we started looking into that um, and getting actual signs made. Uh, there, there are some legalities we need to be careful of. We can't, mm -hmm. obviously, you can never guarantee. Can't sell everything. 
no guarantee there's a safe zone because something happens. Mm -hmm. We got to watch our liability. Mm -hmm. But we are going to try to find an area and maybe get more camera coverage on it. Okay. Where people, Great. for big items, you know, if they want to come into headquarters, we can, we'll advertise it that way also. That, hey, if you want to come in, give us some ID, we'll make sure, that way we know who everybody is involved. And if somebody's up to some nefarious activity, they're not gonna show us ID and walk away and we'd probably just save somebody a headache anyway. Okay. So yeah, we've been involved with that for, for several months now, trying to get it off the ground. And we do have signs made, just a matter of where we're gonna post them. Oh, that's great. Good to know. And we didn't speak before this, so I had no idea. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you, Chief Cook. You're welcome. Good evening, Chief Palumbo. How are you? Good, how are you? Good. All right, uh, just touching, uh, we did receive our uh, extrication tool from the uh, grant we received from Firehouse Subs. Uh, the tool has been placed in service and uh, ready to use it. We are uh, wrapping up our programming with the uh, new radio system through the county and the state system. Uh, they did match us for 13 radios and about six mobile radios, which was a huge cost savings to the township. Uh, we had a busy month in uh, August uh, with uh, responses and calls. Uh, we were involved in a pretty serious fire in Westfield, and the guys did a great job. Um, also, um, we were a part of the um, National Night Out, as well as the uh, Junior Police Academy, Chief Cook and his members invite us over, and we had a good time with the, uh, the young kids in town. So, um, it's been a busy month as far as that. We're getting ready for Fire Prevention Month. Uh, it's called Fire Prevention Week, but we have about 12 schools that we, we educate from pre-K on up to fifth grade on fire safety education and so on. Um, also, just touching quickly on, on the uh, drug epidemic, um, First responders and the public should just be aware that the drug that's out there is uh, highly toxic. Um, there's first responders now becoming overcome by the, the drug. It's the size of a granular of salt, and it can be absorbed through the skin or inhaled accidentally. So if, if you do come across it, please handle with care, notify your police department, um, to let them come out there. As far as that, you know, we've been busy with that and educating our members, and um, so, it's, a, it's out there and it's real, it's real uh, busy with that. So if there's any other questions, I'd be happy to answer them. When, um, uh, when, when do smoke detectors do the permits? I, I got mine in this year, but I just there was one year I forgot to put it in. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. When, isn't it like the beginning of the year? Beginning of the year. So I have no, <clears throat> good. Got it, got it. Oh, thank you. Anybody else? Thank you, Chief. Do you mind if I just, uh, Chief, Chief made me think of something as well. I'm glad he had brought that up. Um, absolutely, there, this stuff out there is so deadly. There have been officers, um, again, just by touch, uh, it's just a, a, a tiny amount that is very powerful and can, can kill or certainly do some serious damage to, to the body. Um, what I would like to mention about that is uh, when we respond to overdose calls, again, which have been on the rise, um, there are times when, unfortunately, a family member finds their family member in this condition, and I don't know if it's a matter of saving face or whatever, they try to clean up the scene before we get there. Um, I just want to say, when, when we do arrive at these scenes, we're not there to prosecute anybody. We're there to assist and save lives. Um, and people are touching these things that they really don't know what they're handling. Um, so it is important, I'm glad you brought that up to get that out there because, you know, God forbid we have a second victim in the same family because they decided to touch and try to clean it up so that we don't see what's laying around. Um, and when we do go to these scenes, it's, we're there to help the family. Again, we're not there to prosecute anybody. We're actually there to try to go after the people that led to their family member being in that condition. We do take cell phones with permission and we will go after if we can find who the supplier of that was, uh, we certainly go after them. So again, please don't clean up. We're not there to judge. We're not there to prosecute. We're just there to assist. So thank you for bringing that What's up. What's the name of this drug? I mean, fentanyl's part of it and there's, there's, there's all these. Cart fentanyl, that's, I mean, it's, there's, there's different 
versions of things coming out every day. There's somebody out in some part of the world thinking, how else can I, uh, you know, get people hooked on stuff the cheapest way possible? And it's just mm -hmm. bizarre chemicals that they're, you know, that's get being introduced out into the, uh, the sh stream of drugs there. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? No. no. Chief, thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Shadi, do you have a report for us? Um, the two items I did want to discuss uh, are below in the discussion action items, um, but I did want to just uh, bring up two things to the attention of the governing body. Um, sorry, just pulling up my note here on that. Apologize. Okay, uh, so the first thing, just want to let you all know, I've invited our legislators uh, to come to Springfield, Senator Tom Kane, Assemblywoman John Bramnick, and Assemblywoman Nancy Munoz, uh, for the uh, for a walkthrough of the downtown. We've had a number of meetings uh, with the DOT and the DEP on issues related to our downtown redevelopment. Uh, one of the biggest projects that's there, known as the the Gomes Project, between uh, Center and Caldwell on Morris Avenue, um, it's moving along. There's you know residents may not see <laughs> action. I know they did a little bit of demolition not too long ago, but there's more work that needs to be done. But they are working diligently in getting the approvals that they need, and I have to commend them on their their efforts. Uh, they are diligent in getting back to myself, getting back to Mr. Mardini and our redevelopment attorney uh, Matt Jessup. But there are issues related to being on Morris Avenue uh, and, and DOT, traffic lights, traffic signals, bump outs that all need to be worked out and so we're going through that process and the same thing with the DEP. Um, so I invited our legislators to come to see actually the project we're talking about. They've written us letters of support in the past uh, to the state to let, them, to, to let the state know that they support our efforts but I think it's one thing for them to actually see the work that's, that's happening and to be able to identify areas where they might be able to assist us with the, the state agencies. Great. So that's targeted for the 22nd at 10 a.m. So if any of you are available to come, please join us. We'll have the developer there as well in addition to our professionals. So, um, can we ask them? Um, yes. Can we ask them to come? Do we have a meeting on the 20th? No. 20th. That's a Friday. That's Friday we, the 22nd. Can we ask them to come to one of our meetings and, all right, because I can't be there at 10 o'clock in the morning. Sure. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, yeah, everybody can't. works, that's about so. <laughs> she can't be here, you know. And, uh, and the people, you know, this way, if we can come, they can even sit up here and we can sit in the crowd, you know. <laughs> and. Um, just talk, you know. Sure, I mean, on, on the topic of, this is for us, for that meeting, it's, it's our, my intent for our professionals and mm -hmm. the developers to show them what we're doing, explain to them what we're trying to do, and see how they can help us. But I'd be happy to invite them along to a township yeah. committee meeting Does everybody agree? and I mean, ask I agree. them to yeah. give yeah. a yeah. legislative it'll, it'll update if you'd like. This way we can just sure. um, see what they could get done for us. Sure, know, I will make a note of that. As you know, since we've started that, Five years ago, six years, whatever it is, it's. I've gotten calls. I'm still, even after full people say nothing's yes. ever going to get done. There. <laughs> I mean, I will tell you, as long as I'm here working with you together, we will get it done. I promise you that. Um, we've got a great team here. We've got a great team of professionals as well. Um, I'm confident that we will get it done. <laughs> um, so that's the first note. The the, ne the next note, I just want to let you know, we did. Bid our, uh, we did put out an advertisement for uh, credit card, debit card merchant services. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, we only got one bid. Um, yes. Very, very disappointing in that. Um, this is uh, a bid that you know the bid specs have been used in this format and in some other towns successfully to solicit up to eight or nine. Um, but we did in that one bid, uh, the one bidder was our existing <laughs> service provider. Uh, and they did give us uh, pretty good rates though, uh, lower rates than I've seen in other towns that I've worked. So it is good news, uh, but Mr. Quick and I are going to break that analysis down a little bit further um, and, and we'll provide you an update on that. And um, that is all I have on that. We'll talk about the RVSA and statewide later on. Okay, thank you. All right, let's move on to minutes and reports. Uh, I move to accept the minutes of the regular executive minutes, meeting minutes of June 13, 2017, as emailed. Um, second. All, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any objections? Any abstentions? I move to adopt the regular and executive meeting minutes of June 27, 2017, as emailed. I, uh, second. 
All in favor? Aye. 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 Any objections? Any abstentions? Abstain. Uh, I abstain. All right, we have an abstention. I move to adopt the Board of Education joint meeting minutes of July 17, 2017 as emailed. I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I Any abstain. Abstain on that as well. Okay. Oh, I'm um, sorry. I move. <laughs> I move to adopt the regular and executive meeting meeting minutes of July 17th as email. I second that. Aye. All, in, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any objections? No. Any abstentions? No. Yes. Maria. Maria. Okay. Okay. We're going to accept the construction monthly report for August 2017 <coughs> as submitted. We're going to move on to new business. We have a second reading. Madam Clerk, can you please read the ordinance by title? Yes, Ordinance 2017-12. This ordinance protects residents of the township who may purchase dogs or cats from a pet shop or other establishment, helps to prevent inhumane breeding conditions, and promotes community awareness of animal welfare. I move to adopt Ordinance 2017-12 as read by Madam Clerk and pub publication local source September 21st, 2017. Second. I'm going to open it up to public comment. Anyone? Any discussion up here? Okay. No. no. Oh. We have a please, please state your name and address. Brian Hackett, New Jersey State Director for the Humane Society of the United States. 700 Gaithers, 700 professional drive in Gaithersburg, Maryland. Uh, I am a New Jersey resident, and I thank you for the opportunity to speak here this evening about this important ordinance. I know that you have lots of things on your agenda, some things that uh, some may feel are much more important than this, perhaps, but um, I represent our members throughout Union County and our state and most importantly, the stakeholders in this, the animals that can't speak for themselves. So just to give you some context as to why this ordinance is being considered by your town this evening and why about 108 towns thus far in New Jersey in just under about two years have uh, passed this ordinance. And I just want to be clear that this ordinance has been passed by uh, towns all over the state run by Democrats, run by Republicans, uh, North, South. It, it's, it's widely, widely supported. Um, this particular ordinance has never been challenged in the state of New Jersey in court. In the uh, six instances it was challenged, it was upheld in court every single time. And this, there's really a reason for this. Puppy mills present the state of New Jersey a major problem because we have pet stores in the state that are sourcing from them. And here's the deal. A responsible breeder does not sell to a pet store. Your ordinance does not harm, hurt, or affect responsible breeders. And here's why. Well, responsible breeders, if you choose not to adopt or rescue, uh, and you go to a responsible breeder, they want to meet you face to face, sell directly to you. They're not shipping their dogs off in vans to some pet store somewhere to be sold to people to churn out the most profit they can out of that living creature as opposed to making sure it's a right fit for you and your family. You're gonna hear that, well, we source, pet stores source from USDA licensed breeders. Let me tell you what USDA licensed breeders, now by the way, just because people have a driver's license doesn't mean they're a good driver. USDA licensed breeders allow wire flooring on their cages. They have small cage space. The animals don't ever have to be taken out of that cage to be socialized, walked, nothing. They don't protect dogs from extreme temperatures. So if there's a puppy mill outside with dogs in wire cages, they can be out there in freezing weather or uh, hot weather, 90 degree weather. The state of New Jersey just passed a law, anti-tethering bill, proper shelter bill. It is illegal to leave a dog outside te tethered in freezing or hot temperatures but these USDA licensed facilities allow that. They don't have an, an opportunity to exercise, be socialized. They allow females to be bred over and over and over again. There's not regular veterinary checks required. They only are required a um, veterinary plan. Uh, so this is egregious. 
The HSUS, uh, you'll see in, in your packets um, that uh, you should have received via email. We did an expose, expose report on New Jersey's pet stores. Uh, 27 of them were found to have egregious violations of the Pet Purchase Protection Act. Uh, and you're gonna hear that uh, the state of New Jersey has the strictest laws on this. Yeah, we do have some pretty strict laws. The problem is it's very difficult to enforce them. And now with the USDA pulling down the inspection reports of these facilities, we don't even know where they're coming from. So it's a major, major problem. I want you to know that this is a pro-business ordinance. This is a pro-consumer ordinance. It is a pro-animal ordinance. Uh, passing this, you don't currently have a pet store and probably never will. But you don't want one opening up that's sourcing from some of these terrible places. Other towns in the state in just the last two years have had to shut down these types of stores. And it's been at outrageously excessive cost to their town. $90,000 in East Hanover. Brick just shut a pet store down. East Brunswick. I can go on and on and on. My last point, there's a reason that in under the last 10 years, we have gone from over 42 pet stores in the state of New Jersey that sell cats and dogs for profit down to 20. It's a dying business model because people are learning the facts about where these animals come from. Some pet stores in the state even employ predatory lending practices where you're virtually leasing or financing a dog and paying thousands upon thousands of extra dollars for this. It's, it's outrageous. So on the last point, when you see a store like PetSmart or Petco, 24 of the 25 largest pet retailers in this country have refused to sell cats and dogs for profit. There's only one pet land that still sells them, and there was just a, an, a bacteria outbreak that the CDC is currently handling because these dogs come from these puppy mills. So that said, I'm happy to address any questions you may have. I thank you sincerely on behalf of the Humane Society of the United States, our many members, our stakeholders here, um, for taking this up. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. You. thank, you. thank you. Okay, Madam Clerk, roll call. Someone else wants to speak. I apologize. Good evening. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Cindy Knowles, and I have a very reputable pet store. Where do you live? I'm sorry? Where do you live? Oh, I'm from Tewksbury, New Jersey. Your address? Your full address. Uh, 812 Halsey Farm Lane, New Tewksbury, New Jersey. Take the microphone, please. I'm sorry. You need the microphone. Can you hear me now? Well, I can hear you, but I want to make sure they in the back can hear you. I mean, you do have you to can, speak into the microphone because it's recorded, and so uh, we have to ensure that uh, it's on. Is that better? Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. Sorry about that. I, I sounded like to myself, like I was speaking loud enough. Um, the only reason the HSUS is um, going town to town right now is because they lost at the state level. Their agenda is extreme, and it goes too far. I have a very reputable shop in New Jersey. We are busier than ever. We can't keep up with the demand of people coming from my beautiful puppies, from my quality breeders. Um, just to give you an idea, they say that these are horrific places. I might have to put this down for a second so I can <coughs> show you a few things. You'll see this in stock contrast. You could just you submit could just the photos see. to the clerk and yeah. she'll pass them down. Yep, yeah, if you could take a look at each one of those one by one. The first picture is a USDA licensed kennel. It's beautiful. You'll see me in that kennel because we go out and visit these breeders. These are not, these are in stark contrast to what the HSUS and the other people that will speak tonight in this room. You see me in one of the kennels. They'll say that the dogs never see the light of day. You see the adult dogs in their play yard, in a beautiful play yard, that they have a play yard but, you know, nicer than most people's backyards. Um, these people want to put us out of business, and they'll stop at nothing to do it. For instance, you're going to hear from a woman tonight that's running around the state and calling on consumer affairs and making fraudulent complaints to consumer affairs. 
She didn't do it to my store. They know to stay away from me. But um, they're not only wasting state legislators' time, they're wasting your time, they're wasting consumer affairs inspections. Here's a recent uh, response to one of her complaints to one of my colleague's stores. I'm sending you this email as a follow-up from my recent visit to your store. I received a complaint in my office regarding documentation as it related to the breeders and the health concerns for the dogs in your store. After completing a thorough investigation, please note that I found no violations and all of your records were up to date and compliant. So this is what we're putting up with. This is what they, this is what they do to us on a regular basis. Again, you see that those pictures look great. Those are the breeders we deal with. It's right, my breeders are USDA licensed. We've worked very hard to have relationships with them. You'll have um, Fawn, New Jersey, who's another you know, organization along with the HSUS. All they want to do is put us out of business. I want to read you the Fawn, New Jersey mission statement. Their mission statement is fur, to get rid of fur and leather mafias, factory farm gestapos, fraudulent vivisectors, cowardly hunters, emotionally and mentally stunted butchers, abdominal circus thugs, vile animal breeding mills, our nausea, our aversion to all of you is unilateral and absolute. All we want to do is provide New Jersey consumers with their wonderful puppies. We have nice families coming to us. A shelter or rescue dog is not right for them, for whatever reason. They may have small children that they're concerned about. There may be allergy issues that the parents are concerned about. We actually let puppies go home. When a family comes in and there's a potential allergy issue, we let them take the puppy home overnight. Take the puppy home, let your child be around it, see if there's an allergy issue. They can't walk into a shelter or rescue and be concerned about a behavioral issue. <coughs> You're not going to find a purebred Shih Tzu puppy in a rescue or shelter, and we're, we'll be the first ones. If that's what's right for you, do it. Now, another problem that's going on in New Jersey is mass trafficking of these dogs from rescues and shelters in the South. There's another gentleman here tonight that forced a store in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, out of business. He forced them to do the shelter rescue model. They were bringing in dogs from Georgia. They had a huge parvo outbreak. The woman in Georgia, the rescue broker, was up on 40 counts of felony charges for falsifying veterinary records. There were no veterinary oversight on these dogs. And then we're bringing them into New Jersey. Well, that shelter rescue model that got set up is now shut down. So I just want you to understand that there's a whole other side of this. There may be 108 towns. We just got involved recently. We were very busy at the state level. Excuse me. Yes. We do have a yep. five minute go time ahead. limit. All right, so I'll just wrap up. To adhere to that with everyone. All I'm saying is if you go from my regulated model, and as Mr. Hackett from the HSUS said, New Jersey has the strictest regulations in the country. And the stores that have been shut down, good, good. They weren't meeting regulations. We are, we're in business, we're thriving. And you know, people, people want our puppies. We've had a lot of town council members and we've also had a lot of state legislators. In fact, Governor Kane, ex-Governor Kane was in my store recently and walked out with a puppy with a good family friend of hers, or his. They come to our store, we invite every one of you to come to our store. Let us show you a compliant New Jersey store. You'll hear that we're not Ma'am, your five minutes is okay. up. We're compliant. The mayor wishes to extend that, okay. but the, you have exceeded the five minutes at this point. All right, we'll we invite through. you in. Thank you, Ms. Lewis. Like the other town council members have come. Thank, thank you. Madam Clerk. Local. Oh. Uh, anybody else? Uh, we have one more. Good evening. My name is Jean Clayton. I live on Holly Road in Warrington, New Jersey. I am a co founder. Oh, I'm sorry. Start over? Okay. 
My name is Jean Clayton. I live on Holly Road in Marlton, New Jersey, and I am a co-founder of New Jersey Residents Against Puppy Mills. Um, you have just heard from Ms. Knowles that she is a reputable pet store. She only buys from the best breeders and is fully compliant with the law. Um, I would like to show you that this is not the reality of pet stores in New Jersey. The United States Department of Agriculture is tasked with inspecting every licensed dog breeder in the country at least once a year. They issue violations when they find breeders who are violating the Animal Welfare Act. In New Jersey, pet stores are not allowed by law to purchase from breeders that have one or more serious violations or three or more less critical violations in the past two years. In spite of this, most of the pet stores currently operating in the state are violating this law by sourcing from breeders with multiple and serious inspection violations. Last year, our group filed complaints with the Consumer Affairs Department for 20 stores for sourcing violations. In fact, In fact, Furrylicious, which is the store that Ms. Knowles, who just spoke, owns, was one of the stores we filed on. She sourced from 39 breeders in 2015. 20 of these breeders had inspection violations, and of these, 14 had more violations than state law allows, a full 36% of her breeders. And this is the list of all her breeders with the violations, if anyone would care to see it. These aren't the only violations pet stores commit. 26 out of the 29 pet stores operating in 2015 were issued fines after inspections found that their stores were not displaying the required consumer information for customers. We used to be able to research breeder inspection reports online at the USDA site. This is how we have all of these reports. The site was shut down in February. Sorry. My hands are so dry. <laughs> the site was shut down in February. The old <coughs> inspection reports used to look like this. I can just hold it up full of information about violations, the breeder's name, address, and license number from the USDA. They just put the site back up in August, and it was a real disappointment to us. This is what they put up now. It's a redacted version. They've taken out the name, the license number. The only thing on here is the state, the city, and if there is a violation, they list it, but you don't know who it's for. It's this violation in this city, in this state, which tells us absolutely nothing. There's no way that you can follow any of this and get information to see who the stores are sourcing from. Without an ordinance, Springfield could be faced with the same problems and expenses as East Hanover, which I'll just mention because Brian did talk about that. The problem here is that the state is not enforcing the laws we have on the books. And now there is no way to check the breeders because of this shutdown of the site. And we cannot rely on the stores to be transparent, given their track record. Our group is here for one purpose only, to stop the inhumane horrors of puppy mills and to protect consumers who are too often the victims of the lies and cover-ups of the pet stores. Uh, on behalf of my group, I thank you very much for your time. Thank, thank you. you. I'm, I'm going to stop that right here. I, I believe we all received at least two to three dozen emails, and I'm sure that I don't think we're going to hear anything different from the public. Anybody else agree with you? Well, I agree with you. Um, and we can go on all night with these comments, so I'd rather just get into our – do we have a discussion up here? Oh. No, I have no discussion. Okay. No discussion. Madam Clerk, if you can, please call roll call. 
Committee Woman Du Bois. Yes. Committee Min Huber. Yes. Committee Woman Bujanowski. Yes. Deputy Mayor Vassallo. Yes. Mayor Stampoulis. Yes. Okay. Ordinance passes. Madam Clerk, please read the next ordinance by title. Ordinance 2017-13. This ordinance amends the ordinance fixing the salaries of certain officers and the pay or compensation of certain position positions and employees within the Township of Springfield for the year 2017. I uh, move ordinance 2017-13 as read by Madam Clerk uh, with publication in the local source September 21st, 2017. I second. Is there public comment regarding this ordinance? Yeah. Discussion up here? No. no. Madam Clerk, roll call. Committee Woman Bujanowski? Yes. Deputy Mayor Vassallo? Yes. Committee Woman Du Bois? Yes. Committee Minuber? Yes. Mayor Stampolis? Yes. Madam Clerk, please read the next ordinance by title. Okay. Ordinance 2017-14. This bond ordinance is to amend in its entirety bond ordinance 2017-09 entitled Bond ordinance to authorize the making of various public improvements in by and for the swimming pool utility of the Township of Springfield to appropriate the sum of $1,400,000 to pay the costs thereof to make a down payment to authorize the issuance of bonds to finance such appropriation and to provide for the issuance of bond anticipation notes in anticipation of the issuance of such bonds adopted June 13, 2017. That was a mouthful. I move to adopt <laughs> Ordinance 2017-14 as read by Madam Clerk with publication in the local source September 14, 2017. Second. Any public comment regarding this ordinance? Discussion up here? Yes, I just want, I'm still waiting to see a schedule. I have not seen a schedule, I want a schedule yes, presented. Yes, you will be getting one. Mm -hmm. All right. I, I promise you, you will get one. Oh. Carrier pigeons. Because I, I want to make sure we get it, because I want to make yes. sure nothing falls behind. Yep. Thank you. Anybody else? No. Roll call, Madam Clerk. Committee Woman Bojanowski. Um, yes. Committee Man Schuber. Yes. Committee Woman Du Bois. Yes. Deputy Mayor Vassallo. Yes. Mayor Stampolis. Yes. Madam Clerk, can you please read the next ordinance by title? Ordinance 2017-15. This ordinance repeals Township of Springfield Ordinance 2016-29 and instructs the Township Clerk to have the public question previously authorized removed from the November 7, 2017 general election ballot. Madam uh, Mayor, uh, as read by the Clerk, 2017-15, Ordinance 2017-15, um, and a local source, September 21st, 2017. I second. Is there a public comment regarding this ordinance? Discussion up here? No. no. Madam Clerk, roll call. Committee Min Huber. Yes. Committee Woman Du Bois. Yes. Committee Woman Bujnowski. No. Deputy Mayor Vassallo. No. Mayor Stampoulis. Yes. Yep. Moving on to first readings. We have none. Um, let's move on to our resolutions. Let's adopt the resolutions by consent agenda. If anyone has an objection to include any of these resolutions, please let me know if you like it pulled. 201722 201722298, 201722309, 201723020, 201723201723, 201723232, 201723232, 201723232, and 2017, oh, no, I'm sorry, that's, that's the last one. Is there a motion? Uh, I make a motion to adopt resolutions 2017, 228, 229, 230, 231, 232, and 233 by consent. Second. I second. Oh. Okay. Madam, who's, who's ladies, the ladies before gentlemen. Erica. Okay, Erica, okay. Committee woman Bojanowski. Yes. Committee Woman Du Bois. Yes. Committee Man Huber. Yes. Deputy Mayor Vassallo. Yes. Mayor Stampoulis. Yes. Okay. All right, let's move on to discussion and action items. I move to approve off premise and 50 50 raffle license 1280 to Lucas Foundation of America, New Jersey chapter, drawn to be held on December 18, 2017 at 150 Morris Avenue. Second. 
All in favor? Aye. 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 Any objections? Any abstentions? I move the County of Union Memorandum of Understanding and Hold Harmless Agreement for Leaf Composting Facility. As host community, the township will not be charged for leaf disposable. Second. Disposal. Sorry. <laughs> Disposable. Okay. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any objections? Any abstentions? Okay, let's move on to the RS RVSA annual review. Mr. Shahi, are you? Sure. Um, I'm going to just quickly turn it over to you, though, uh, just tee it up. Uh, at, there's the best practices inventory that we have to complete that we do the joint uh, meeting with the Board of Ed. One of those items listed on there is an annual review of any and all authorities um, that the township has. The only authority that we've got is the RVSA. And so um, we just have to discuss, uh, per their request, <laughs> um, whether this is uh, a good thing, whether the RVSA, could, one, continues to serve the public interest, and two, uh, are, is it more efficient than any other potential alternatives in providing the services and financing those facilities? Um, so I will turn it over to you. If you want any background on it, I'd be happy to answer. I know also Deputy Mayor Vassallo actually what, what was are, on there. What are our speaker. alternative options? The alternative options are to leave and to start right. our own sewage authority. <laughs> <laughs> With that, I need to use the bathroom. So, so at, at, at this point, let's consider it discussed. Yeah. No. Okay. okay. So it, uh, it has been discussed, and we have okay. and let the minutes show that the uh, governing body finds that it is the, uh, the best option at the moment. And it does yeah. serve the public interest. Okay. Um, that was done. Easy. Move, yeah. Move <laughs> um, on to statewide. Yep. The next one, uh, we did get, uh, I did email you all, we did get a, a refund from an earlier assessment due to uh, an over uh, overfund. And so we're getting about 20 something thousand dollars back. The question from them was, do we want it in a check for this year or do we want it counted towards the next year as a deduction? Um, my recommendation is that we take it in cash, um, more so for accounting purposes, one way or the other. Um, it does the same thing. If we get it in cash this year, it's not like we can use it this year either. It goes into our general fund, and then next year we would be able to tap into our general fund for whatever purposes we deem fit based on the budget. Um, I like it better than deducting it because it shows the consistent assessment. We can actually look at the budget year to year and say this was the true assessment as opposed to an artificially lower assessment. Okay. Uh, Mr. Quick and I discussed, I think we both concur with that. Yeah. So I just Perfect. wanted to get a vote from the governing body sure. so I can sign off on this letter and tell them that that is what we want. Okay, Madam Clerk, roll call. Uh, Committee Woman Budjanowski? Yes. Committee Woman Dubois? Yes. Committee Man Huber? Yes. Um, Mayor Stampoulis? Yes. Okay. All right, uh, Thank we're you. moving on to correspondence. Any? Can, Any unfinished business? Can I just bring up one thing? Sure. Okay. Um, the garage sale was this past weekend. And I thought, and it's only my thinking, I thought it was great the week after the pool closed. I think mean, it was a good timing and all that. I don't know what we did. But next year for September, I like to think about putting it at the pool. The pool closes, one stop for everybody. They don't have to go around to like, like a flea market? Yeah, you know, like a flea market. Like in the parking lot, right? Right in the parking not lot. Not in our new... No, yeah. Not in facility. the building. No. Don't no. bring your stuff well, in the building. I mean, you know, this way... And and then and instead of doing the... Because um, you have the electrical stuff the first of the month. You know, the first Saturday oh, the of the month. electronic recycling. Instead of moving that, that uh, would be September 1st, we move it to the 9th instead of collecting it then. And we have the, the guys come in in the afternoon and when people can get rid of all their stuff right there, and be done. It would be good for people who live in apartments that can't do a garage sale. I think I would have taken advantage of something I mean, like that if that's a It's just a idea. thought. Okay. You know, I, I thought of it and I said, you know, because I was driving around and, and like there's a couple of people trucks. on Mountain Avenue, a couple of people here. So, I mean, all in one spot. We can think about it. Yeah. Like really one, I know one of the first years uh, we did allow uh, a sort of a flea market at the, the fall festival. Uh, I believe it was it the first year, Mr. Seidel, or the second year? But I'm not saying that, but I'm just saying, like, um, all right, my, my wife collects the stuff for a year. <laughs> <laughs> and now I'm stuck putting it out to the curb. I think one Mr. garage Huber. sale a year. Mr. Huber, should. I think you're always going to have to do something. Yeah. Like this. No, I, but I, I mean, I think just one stop for the people. 
Right. Just think about it. We have a year. Like so. I said, as somebody who lives in an apartment who yeah. cannot necessarily have a garage sale, if maybe one of the garage sale dates here we had a centralized location, I think people could be interested in doing something like that. And maybe, I mean, we, you do permits for the garage sale, right? If we had to like pay for a little spot or whatever, I think it might be a good idea if it's something that's within zoning or whatever we can do. Okay. Something to think about. All right. All right. Made a note so of it. I know that uh, Rich, you brought up, uh, you know, the garage sale. So we're also, uh, the township is collecting for Hurricane Harvey victims at mm -hmm. Chisholm. Uh, we've actually had that until September 14th. Uh, you know, I'm not sure if we're going to think about it, maybe even extending it just because in light of the storms that uh, hit Louisiana and Florida. So, but right now it's September 14th. Uh, any cash donations, if you could uh, make those payable to Springfield Hope. And all of those donations will go directly to uh, the people in Houston uh, at the moment. And uh, again, any donations, they need uh, cleaning supplies. You know, there's a list online that you can take a look for, and uh, we're collecting those over at Chisholm. Yep. Thank you. Somebody did ask me about that, and I don't, I'm asking, um, how are we going to get the cash donation down to the people there? Do you have mm -hmm. contacts there? Mr. I mean, I'm, you know, I don't know. They asked me. Yes. State your name. Scott Seidel, 407 Rolling Rock Road. You live in Springfield? I do. <laughs> Uh, we've, we've discussed it among the trustees of Hope, and I've talked to uh, Jerry about it as well. And we're going to, she's got a list of uh, charities in Houston. And one of our concerns is that whoever we donate to, the bulk of the money goes directly to those affected yes. and not to run the organization. Yes. Right. And that's something that's that. very near and dear to our hearts at Hope, since uh, we almost have no overhead fees and everything goes uh, to help people in town from Hope. So we're going to look at that. I know uh, Dr. Heck has been in touch with one or two organizations. Uh, the Rotary has somebody that they've spoken to. So we'll, we'll go over it uh, with Jerry and Maria before we do anything and decide which organizations. And we'll probably pick more than one to divvy the money up. Okay. I'm, I'm actually, um, to your point, I'm, I'm speaking to an individual who is a friend that I know who has family directly in the hardest hit areas of Houston. So she's giving, me, she's giving me a few names, and she's kind of giving me a day-by-day, play-by-play situation of what's going on there. And um, money is definitely needed. Um, and not only just monetary donations, but what we, one thought I had is uh, mon monetary donations by way of gift cards. So if we can get gift cards down to these individuals to go to uh, Target or Walmart, that's really what they need. They're getting a lot of clothing, and they are so, I'm, I'm hearing this directly from her family. They are so grateful for what we've done for them so far in um, not just neighboring states, but states that aren't even that close to Texas. Uh, but what they really do need is the money to purchase exactly what they need. Um, and I do have some local organizations, some local missions, and some churches that are going to work directly with these individuals in specific towns to make sure they don't go to a town that doesn't need as much. So uh, we, we are working diligently on that. Right. Right. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's kind of a, some back end work that I've been doing because, as everybody knows, it's day by day. We have to you know yes. play it by ear, Scott. So and that was, and I that appreciate was, it moved that. Moved on to some other states. I, I believe, right. and I'm not a member of Rotary, but I was talking to. Uh, uh, Paula and Gary today uh, from Rotary, and I believe they're doing something with gift cards, and they were getting $25 gift cards that they're going to uh, send. So we could do that. We could even go talk to some stores. I know we have a, a deal with ShopRite when we get cards. They give, and that's uh, easy hope, to get down there because it's cheap. I hope, cheap, hope, cheap, hope gives us a correct. discount, so possibly we could go talk to a Target or a Walmart and maybe a manager or something like that. Uh, Less overhead for the shipping so more. Yeah. Right, and I know we have right. some residents in town. If you want to just spread the word, and anybody who's listening or anybody who's here wants to get to maybe five friends, they, they are in dire need of adult diapers. She said it's not the sexiest thing ever <laughs> when you bring those things up, but they need them. There's a lot of elderly people there that just cannot get to the store. Mm -hmm. And in addition to that, they need um, rain boots. Big time. But I'd so also those two like items are piggyback off that that I know support the girls, which is a charitable organization in town, has done a lot of work sending feminine hygiene products and bras and they, they shipped a lot it. down there. So yeah. I just want to give yeah. them a shout out, even though they're not here today. I know they right. did a great job and sent a ton. Yeah. And I know I've heard, and I don't think we're doing a blood drive right now, but blood is something that people can give in these times of crisis. And if people can get out there and do that as well, even though we're not doing that, that they can reach out to somewhere where they can give blood because with this storm season approaching and every day it seems like there's another one they definitely need blood so if you don't have the money or the items 
a lot of us can donate blood. St. James has a blood drive awesome. at the end yeah. of, uh, at the yeah, end of September. Doing, oh, thank you. Doing it. Well, you want to just state your blood. website? I know I put it in the paper, but just in case people read my article. Springfieldhope.com, and we did update our website. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much. And, uh, thank there's, you, There's, I Scott. believe, a flyer in the Patriot. If it didn't come out today, it'll be in mailboxes tomorrow. Okay, yeah. I'm going to check you. that thank website you. later. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, at this time, I'm going to open it up to public comment. Anyone from the public would like to speak on governmental issues? Please come forward, state your name, and be time be mindful of our time limit. Jerry Fernandez, 393 Hillside Avenue. Just want to thank Deputy Mayor and the committee for the uh, proclamation on ovarian cancer um, for September. My my grandmother did pass away from that October second, 1998. And I know in the past we've tealed the town in blue, and it's something that it's nice to see continue. Um, the symptoms for that are very, they call it the silent killer. Mm -hmm. So it is real you know, common things of just feeling full or going to the bathroom a little more than normal. And um, just from what I've heard and I've been involved in trying to raise money and bring awareness, a lot of the issues that you always hear women that, that have this cancer say is they just didn't feel right. There was something wrong. And looking back and, you know, it's hard to detect. There's only one test that can be done. To, uh, to find it, but if you don't feel right, you know your body better than, than anyone else, and please visit the doctor, and uh, I'm glad we were able to bring awareness to this. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anyone else from the public? State your name. Hi, Fran Sandler, 101 Madison Terrace. Um, I live in the neighborhood by the golf course where the PGA ran its routes with the buses, et cetera, and 2016. Um, the neighborhood roads took a pretty big hit from the buses and all the transportation that ran through their shuttles, etc. Um, subsequently, PSE&G came through our neighborhood this past year and ripped up pretty much every single road in the neighborhood. Um, they very nicely, I guess is the word, mm -hmm. graciously repaved mm -hmm. about 95% of our neighborhood. Did a great job very minimal inconvenience. They were courteous with the residents, so I greatly appreciate that with the comings and the goings. Um, however, my street, Madison Terrace, I've been living there 24 years. It has not been paved. Mm. It did not get paved. They cut two, uh, two or three holes on the street, which they patched over. Mm -hmm. um, the street needs to be repaved. And I've come here over the last five years once or twice and mention that the curbs look awful. And now the entire neighborhood has been repaved with the exception of our street. Additionally, they did work on Wentz Avenue from Briar Hill Circle all the way down the hillside. They did not repave it at all. So between, and, and my husband emailed me pictures when I was on my way here, and I'm happy to send them to anyone or anyone can go and take a look between Briar Hill Circle and and hillside, the road is a disaster. There's hill, there, there's holes, there's dips, mm -hmm. there's, it's just awful. And the fact that they did work on Wentz and they didn't repave Wentz is disgraceful. It's, it's awful, you can't drive yeah. on Wentz yeah. Avenue, especially between yeah. Edgewood yeah. and, and Briar Hill Circle. Yeah. You, you can't drive that road anymore. It's, it's just awful, it's impassable. It's really very much neglected. Um, so it's something that the town neither needs to address with PSE and G, or they need to. I don't know what the paving yeah, plan is. Let's let's see if there's an update. I'm yeah. assuming you I don't have know an update. why the assumption is that Wentz is not being paved. PSE and G is not paving it, but the town is paving it. We did at the last meeting discuss it. Also, we've okay. we've advertised for bids. Uh, the bids are going to be open uh, soon. Uh, it was part of the hard work of our engineer, Mr. Mardini, who did a swap to get them to pave certain roads completely and in exchange the town is paving Wentz. Okay. They paved roads that uh, they didn't necessarily need to do entirely, um, but were on our matrix, so it was a swap. So Wentz is being paved. Any idea when it might be? Well, one after it's, it's- just gonna get worse as, as the cold weather comes in. Sure, after it, there's a period of advertising, then opening the bids, then awarding the bids, and then the work starts. The money has to be used mm -hmm. uh, because it's uh, by way of a grant, I believe, from the county that it has to be used by the end of the year. So it will be awarded 
uh, probably at a meeting in October, and then the work will be able to start uh, and be complete by the end of the year. Um, Madison to at the you at the end of <laughs> at the end of been baked in the 24 years I'm living there. at the end of uh, every year or so uh, after all the road repaving projects are done the engineering department and public works department do go out and annually evaluate all the roads um, I am looking at the road matrix and there are again this is not counting for the roads that have been taken care of this year it is in the top 20 of roads to be done so uh, that's where it stands right now but it will be reevaluated as they are every year, it, and if the conditions. Know, it was a big PGA stop. Sure. No, I understand, but even. I had neighbors that rented their driveways to right. shuttle companies, mm -hmm. and we had buses going up sure. and down our street several times a day, and and it's just it's a mess. Right. So when it does get reevaluated, like, yep. So when it does re get a, get reevaluated, if those conditions have contributed to it being worse than others, then it does move up in the, the matrix. If it, if there are others that are worse than it, then those w roads do get tended to first. It's all based on, you know, a, a number of evaluation criteria. And so, I can give you a list of about I can give you a list of about three to five dozen roads that also have not been paved since they were first paved. There's a lot in this town. <laughs> We're trying to catch up with. Yeah. We, 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 we put program in uh, how many years ago? When we, you know, when Mr. Fernandez was there and Charlie on, on, on up here. And we put a plan in to do, uh, give so much money a year toward it. And we can go, you know, and, and they evaluate the roads, as we said. And then they'll say, well, um, Rose Avenue really could go another two years, even though. We could do that. Even though you live on it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, no. I, but I've come to you a couple of times. I, I, I know. I recognize you. I do yeah, recognize you. I'm living here 24 years and paying my taxes religiously for 24 years, and I'm not getting anything done well, on the street. Well, can we just have Sam go out and check yeah. out check that road? Yeah. And then we'll get into, like, if it comes to Shahadi during the day, he's here. And if. And at night, too. <laughs> and, and, you know, and, and uh, he'll, he'll send Sam out to check it, and I'll get a report for today. So it's Tuesday. Tuesday. So like by Thursday, around Thursday, give him a call and see what the see what he says. Can you just double check if PSE and G was actually doing work on that? Why they only did bits and pieces, and being that it was part of the plan for sure. Walter Shaw, if they actually did work on our street within the last five years, they did work on one side of the street and they dug some pretty big holes, and then they they you know they paved, paved over it. the big holes on the one side of the street. But then they did come back this this year, and they did dig in a few more other spots. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of patchy. But then the buses and the shuttles and and all that you know all that traffic from the PGA only made it worse. Yeah. And, as they, and the curbs are kind of sinking. And, mm -hmm. you know, the blocks. Are Mr. Shadi, just check with PC and G yep. to make sure if the, why there's reason bits and pieces mm -hmm. instead of the entire street was taken care of. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else from the public? Hi, my name is Stephanie Earle. I'm with Prairie Delicious. Can I have your name again? I'm sorry. I... Um, I'm Stephanie Earle. I'm with okay. Prairie Delicious. I'm the pet store in White House Station, New Jersey. Um, I was disappointed I was not able to speak before. Um, you voted on the ordinance, and I guess I misunderstood the email I got today. I thought it was being tabled for further discussion. Um, I would like you to know that we are fully compliant, Pet Store. The report that they're referring to was generated from 2015, and there are many flaws in that report, and it does not reflect the truth. So I don't know if there's some kind of appeal process, waiting period, or what have you, um, but we are 100% compliant. Our breeders are quality breeders. They like to say, HSUS, that no reputable breeder would ever sell their, um, their puppies to a pet store. I'm here to tell you that we have great reputable breeders and they sell to pet stores because they know that we step in and we make sure because we're liable for any illnesses and we have to deal with the public um, brick and mortar, we're right there, we have to make sure we're finding the right fit for their puppy. This is what we do. This is a professional business and our breeders are professionals and I think you'd be surprised to know that uh, one, one of the things that I'm gravely concerned about is in your ordinance it's written and I know HSUS and Jean Clayton are writing this ordinance we've seen it all around the state 
They say there are 10,000 breeders, 10,000 um, breeders in the United States, producing 2.4 million dogs. I can tell you that there are 1,500 USDA licensed breeders, and they produce less than 10% of that amount. So there are many, many breeders, substandard, unlicensed breeders out there supplying puppies to the public. There's no doubt. But that is not USDA breeders. USDA are the only breeders that are regulated by the, US, by the um, federal government. They're sanctioned by the federal government to conduct business through direct to consumers and with pet stores. Pet stores must by law buy from USDA breeders. We're only supplying about 3% of the puppies in the United States to consumers, 3%. We're like a very, very small portion, but we are deal we're selling to a niche business or a niche consumer that needs hypoallergenic. They have size constraints. Um, they have, um, um, you know, other, whatever the, the case may be, they want a certain purebred um, dog. So that's the niche that we fill. Um, fill. Um, our breeders, on average, our breeding dogs, on average, have five puppies per year. They don't breed until they're about 18 months to two years, and their productivity, and I know, you know, some people are, you know, it is a business and it is um, a profession. So, uh, you know, when I talk about, you know, their production and that kind of thing, you have to understand it, it's sometimes, you know, taken out of context, it's maybe it sounds harsh to some people, but they breed their dogs, like I said, um, they start at 18 months to two years. And their productivity, they have their best litters for, for the next four or five litters, the most productive. The average litter is five dogs, five puppies. Um, breeding dogs are usually bred till they're about four or five years old and then they're retired. The um, average USDA breeder has about 50 dogs in their kennels, 50. Not 300, not 1,000, not 500. And of those 50, about um, usually about 10% are males, stud males. So they, you know, they're obviously not being, they're not breeding, they're not, they're not having puppies. Um, uh, about 12.5% are resting, um, or puppies held back, I should say. That means that They've kept them from their litters, knowing that they're going to be retiring some dogs, so that they keep puppies and they're not going to breed until they're about, until they're about two, you know, 18 months to two years old. Um, and then there's um, resting puppy uh, breeding dogs. So every, usually every other cycle, or sometimes not. It's not an exact science, but there's a certain number of them that aren't breeding. So then you're down to about 30 breeding dogs, 30 female breeding dogs. In a puppy, in a um, in a USDA breeder, these are not these are not puppy mills. They're just not. They're nice facilities, and the best way to ensure. I'm sorry, I'm a little nervous, but um, the best way to ensure that they're putting out healthy, good-looking, um, well-socialized puppies is to have parents that are well taken care of, and they do this through nutrition, through pop proper shelter, through veterinary care. It's not true that they don't see a vet. Just because it says that veterinary care just has to be written up. How can you run a kennel and not have, I mean, we all have pets. How can you run a kennel to produce puppies and, not, and, and have pregnant dogs and not have veterinary care? It's ridiculous. So I don't know, like I said, my request was, or my question was, is there any recourse? Is there any possibility of reconsidering this? Um, we think we're being very unfairly maligned and very unfairly targeted. And I didn't know if there was a possibility of, I mean, I could provide, you know, endless amounts of information, which I know I already have, <laughs> if some of you remember my name or not, but I just wanted to just ask the question. Now, uh, we've already made our decision on the ordinance and it passed, but thank you. Thank you. Anyone else from the public? <clears throat> Thank you. Hi, everybody. Can you state your name? Sylvia Ingersbowski, 22 Brook Street, and I would like to thank every committee member who just defended all of the puppies. There are many, many adoption sites that you can list what allergies your children have. We're listening to two examples from Tewksbury and White House Station. 
Why don't they talk about Elizabeth, Hillside, North? What's in our area? Thank you so much for defending the pets and passing that. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else from the public? Seeing none. I'm Kirk. Okay. Can we you read? Are going into closed session, resolution 91217, whereas Article 6 of the Open Public Meetings Act provides that a public body may hold a closed session, and whereas the Township Committee will, during this meeting, enter into discussion of the following matters. Personnel for the CFO position, and we have added potential litigation zoning, whereas the matters to be discussed in closed session are to remain in the strictest of confidence by all Township Committee members in furtherance of their fiduciary duties to the Township. Now, therefore, be it resolved, matters discussed at this meeting will be released to the public when the reasons for discussing and acting upon them in closed session no longer exists. Is there a motion? Motion. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any objections? Second. Any of the second? Who was the second? A second. Any, any objections? Any abstentions? Also, I would like to let the public know that we will not be taking any action when we come out. We will be adjourning the meeting. Thank you. Thank you.